Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we jump into this new episode, we'd like to take a moment and thank you for your continued support. Many of you asked how you can support us. One great way is to subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Each month, we collect and curate information about the latest scientific advances in the field, as well as biotech and pharmaceutical news. Subscribe today at drgpcr.com newsletter. We would also like to hear from you. Please take a moment to tell us how to make Dr. GPCR work for you by filling out any of our surveys on drgpcr.com survey. You can tell us what you think about the podcast, the summit, and even Dr. GPCR in general. Stay tuned as we are working on the 2022 Dr. GPCR Summit Edition. And we also have been busy working on a brand new secret project. Visit drgpcr.com to find out more about all our activities. And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. Uh, I am excited to have with me on the podcast today, Dr. Juan Jose Fong. He is a principal scientist at GPCR Therapeutics. Uh, Juan Jose and I met uh, in February 2021 on a panel, and uh, I'm super excited to have him today with us. Hi, Juan Jose. Hi, Yamina. It's wonderful to be here and very excited to talk to you today. Thank you. For, thank you for joining us. So let's let's start at the beginning. Um, where uh, where did you where did your career start in the GPCR field? Ah, that's a great question. And so, um, I actually, you know, bef- before heading into uh, graduate work, um, I I worked at a small startup company in Santa Clara it's called uh, Xenoport, and really, I started working there really just to you know kind of pay for pay for college, you know, a little bit naive, you know, I was a a pre-med major, you know, interest in biology. And so I started a a part-time job there at at Xenoport. Um, Xenoport was at the time interested in, uh, you know, hijacking high capacity membrane transporters to increase drug bioavailability um, and uh, target specific tissues uh, and organs. They eventually developed a um, orally bioavailable version of gabapentin for restless leg syndrome. And so anyway, I started there as a lab technician and, and also, you know, doing shipping and receiving, glassware washing, all, you know, a, a job for, you know, an entry level lab technician that, that you can imagine. Um, but I kind of was, like I said, I, I was a biology major and I wiggled my way into assisting a senior scientist there, um, doing many preps and doing some aspects of phage display panning. And so once I, uh, uh, this was during undergrad, once I, I uh, graduated, it really worked out nicely. There was a position in the high throughput screening team there. And so I started as an RA um, in uh, doing cell-based high throughput screening against membrane transporters and I just like completely fell in love with membrane proteins. It was just, it was a fun company, first of all, but just really, uh, you know, working on uh, these set of uh, of proteins just really opened up my eyes. It it was nothing that I had really studied in in undergrad. And so it really taught me, you know, a lot about um, not only uh, drug discovery, but it also opened up my eyes to really, you know, the curiosity of, but how is it that these membrane transporters work? There's so many different subtypes. How is, how are some more selective for some substrates or others? And so that actually, you know, being there for a few years, it really propelled me into wanting to go into uh, graduate school. And so, um, you know, I, I obtained my uh, PhD at, at Stanford, but um, your original question was, how did I get into studying GPCRs? It's kind of a funny story and also embarrassing at the same time. Um, so like I just, I told you, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say funny. We love funny stories. There was no such thing as an embarrassing story. It is your story. And yeah, you so, wouldn't believe how many people, um, you know, say, t- tell these stories. And sometimes it's completely by accident because like me, I was in Michel Bouvier's class as an undergrad and I was like, oh, this is really cool. Mm-hmm. Or others who are like, I never really wanted to work on this. I just happened to be told <laughs> this is what you're working on. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's so, hear your I mean, story. I, I, 
just went on and on about membrane transporters. As you can imagine, that's actually um, kind of what I wanted to do in graduate school. So I had, uh, you know, going into my first, I guess, semester at, at Stanford University, um, I, I realized really quickly that I was very unprepared. Um, I had actually not um, aligned or, or lined up, I should say, my rotations for the fall. I actually thought, you know, I'd go in and, and you know, just start working in a lab. That's really naive on my part. I already knew two of the three rotations I wanted to do. I figured I'd figure out, uh, you know, my third one later on. Um, and so the rotations I, I thought I wanted to do, they were full. People, they were not taking more graduate students. And so I was kind of, you know, that first week at Stanford, I was, you know, pretty stressed out that, I already basically failed my my first exam, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. starting out graduate school. And so um, I, I was in the molecular and cellular physiology department. And so I started going through other faculty profiles. I remember sitting at the um, Stanford library, just really not, not feeling really uh, highly about myself, I, I guess. Pick up the phone one last time to see if this other professor would pick up. Luckily for me, he did. He said, yeah, I can take on an MCP rotation student. It ended up being Brian Kabilka. Um, and so he was, he was there to save the day for me. Um, you know, met him, you know, gave me some, some projects to work on. And, you know, like they say, the, the, the rest is history. And that's how I started working on GPCRs. But really, it sounds embarrassing that my first rotation um, was kind of like a last resort. And I kind of had to pick something. But... You know, that's, that, that's how it went. And one thing I didn't know at the time was the financial struggles that Brian's lab was actually going through um, with the, you know, Howard Hughes medical funding. I think uh, Bob Lefkowitz has mentioned this before. I only found out later after, you know, my rotation and probably during my first official year there, um, what was going on. But, you know, I, I, I joined his lab happily knowing absolutely zero about GPCR. So there's nothing that had been covered in, in undergrad. So. I began working on um, a few projects. Uh, one was characterizing uh, antibodies developed by a uh, local, um, actually a local biotech company where our CSO Pina Cardarelli worked at. Um, they had developed some antibodies against the, the beta 2. Um, and I was just looking at their ability to induce conformational changes um, in the receptor, as well as generating fab fragments for, um, you know, for Brian to grow crystals. I was obviously overwhelmed with all the new techniques, the new subject matter. Only a little while later did I realize, you know, it's sort of the, uh, the, the brilliance of these projects that I was, you know, allowed to contribute to, at, you know, just from the get-go. Um, one thing I, I will say that I immediately did realize was that, you know, Brian, Brian Kabilka was the real deal as a scientist. I just, you know, learned so much from him really. and. Um, you know, to this day, I, I just take some lessons from from that I picked up, you know, watching him and, and seeing, you know, how he goes about things. So that's, that's, I, that's I a... ended up falling in love with GPCRs as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're membrane protein, so it's close enough. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> it, it's close enough. That's a wonderful story. I don't I don't think you should be embarrassed about it. I think there are a lot of uh, learning moments. And I loved the the fact that, you know, you made a great point at pointing out that you should have thought ahead of time. And as luck has have has it, you ended up in Brian Kobilka's lab. But I think to 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 the trainees listening to the podcast, there was an important point into thinking about where do you want to go and planning. That doesn't mean that it's going to happen. It just means that you internally figure out what is it that you would like. And I think it helps give you a direction. And um, that's important. I ended up doing a, a, master, an, a, a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in biochemistry. And the reason why it ended up being biochemistry, I don't know if I said this on, on a podcast before, and I think this is more embarrassing than your story. <laughs> Is because when I was choosing uh, what uh, what field to go to, biochemistry started with a B, and the next choice would have been chemistry, and they took me into biochemistry, and that's the reason <laughs> it happened. And you loved it; but it was I'm, a good fit. It was it was a good fit. It was a good fit, 
So sometimes I think uh, serendipity plays a role, but I think planning it, planning, trying to think ahead um, right. and also being able to adapt to whatever doesn't work or whatever works in your life. And I think who would have thought, have had you planned ahead, do you think you would have ended up in Brian's lab? That's right. You exactly. Don't we don't know. If I had planned all my three rotations perfectly, I may have been, yeah. you know, working on ion channels, not, which would be great as well. But, um, you know, work, working in Brian's lab was certainly, you know, very special. See, so I think I think it's that's a great take home message and a great learning learning uh, message. Yeah, for, I think for the so. audience. And, you know, just like like you mentioned, you know, planning ahead is is good, but the adaptability. Really, you know, staying curious, really being yep. uh, flexible to there's so many interesting things to work on. So um, absolutely. And then and then what happened after you know, getting your, your PhD in in, uh, in Brian's lab? How did you end up at, at GPCR Therapeutics yeah. where you are today? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, like like I opened up saying, you know, I had a great experience at this, you know, startup company, um, Xenoport. And I actually, through, throughout my graduate studies, I always had sort of the uh, the notion that I'd end up going back into industry. Um, I just like the uh, the translational aspect of science. Plus, we're actually also trying to develop a, a drug um, to you know target some sort of disease. So I like that idea. I, that that was really interesting to me. And so I, uh, after my postdoc, which you know I stayed on in, in Brian's lab because. You know, just great things were happening. Um, I worked at, at uh, several uh, local uh, startup companies, um, looking at um, membrane transporters, um, uh, methods for improving uh, antibody uh, purification. Um, obviously, leaning on the the uh, some of the uh, expertise I gained in Brian's lab, um, as well as you know, just uh, uh, starting my own uh, small. Uh, company just focused on generating um, uh, membrane protein related um, uh, reagents and also um, sort of a CRO type services. Um, but, you know, um, one of the uh, uh, a recruiter, uh, I guess, uh, working for GPCR Therapeutics reached out and really offered this wonderful opportunity to, you know, come, come in and, you know, have an impact in, uh, I think, a field for GPCRs that is um, sort of um, slightly underappreciated. So, you know, uh, GPCR Therapeutics is really working on um, uh, uh, targeting cancer. And in particular, actually, they're uh, looking at uh, GPCR heteromers and um, trying to exploit those. And the reason, an additional reason why I, I like what GPCR Therapeutics was doing was uh, my uh, graduate work was looking at uh, beta two receptor dimers and dimerization. So that whole field to me was just, um, you know, really felt like home. It really felt like that's uh, sort of what I should be doing. And, you know, obviously not, not to mention you, you've met my, uh, the CSO, my uh, current manager, Pina Carter. She's just a really wonderful uh, person to work with went ahead and, uh, you know, d decided to uh, join GPCR Therapeutics and really I've been there for over a year and just, you know, really happy to, uh, you know, be contributing to the, the great science and, and the approaches that, that the company's taking. Fantastic. And and I, yes, I did. I did meet Pina and she is wonderful. And to those who will be listening to this episode, by that time, we would have released the episode that I recorded with her talking about her fantastic career as well. And love, love, you, you, you said it, you were going to, you know, you said that it was really going home, uh, you know, working on dimers, beta adrenergic receptors. And I was just thinking the same, that you're really, it was meant to be, see? So not being prepared That's right. <laughs> for rotations got you to where you were supposed to be. That being said, still having, uh, doing some kind of preparation is uh, yeah. preferred. I mean, I, I knew I wanted to work on membrane proteins, right? So that's some sort of preparation. <laughs> yes, but you knew that. Yeah, exactly. That's that's fantastic. Before we move on to, to the next yeah. series of more scientific questions, what I wanted to ask you is, you mentioned that in undergrad, you were in biology. Um, uh, the 15 year old you, what was he interested in? Ah, very good question. So um, 
I've actually really always been interested in, you know, the in human health and disease. And so I actually, so I told you I, I enrolled in, you know, pre-med major, so, or pre-med program um, in undergrad. So I actually really wanted to be a, a medical doctor or physician, which is, you know, one of those kind of quote unquote, typical careers one is exposed to or that you had knowledge of, right? My parents were not college graduates. I was an immigrant from Latin America. And so being a scientist was just, I, I had never heard of that. Uh, it's something I didn't really knew of or was exposed to. So um, really, I think there's a lot of experiences there, you know, going into, uh, um, I, I went to a small liberal arts college. Um, so I got a general biology background, really gave me the, the uh, opportunity to experience, um, you know, what science truly was aside from there's more to it than, you know, being a doctor and, and treating patients. And so there's this other aspect of making the discoveries, making drugs, you know, combine that with some of the uh, early experiences I had in the industry as well. That that sort of, you know, kind of got me here. That's that's so great. And you mentioned, you know, being from from an immigrant family. Mm -hmm. Same, also, me being from an immigrant family, typically you're either a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, or something. Engineer, something. maybe. Yeah. Oh, no, an engineer. Yes, obviously. <laughs> right. But th that's that's about that's about it when you're growing yeah. up because that's what you're told and that's what you think about. Yeah. And uh, I I was also pushed towards a medical career or a being a dentist, and it's it's definitely not for me. And I think discovering working in the lab gave me another perspective about, you know, still using analytical skills and science to actually co complete, you know, the, this is the other side of the coin. Yes, that's exactly right. Exactly. You see sort of the behind the scenes of, you know, in my case, I had never really thought of how did that drug come about, you know, when you're growing up, it's just doctors give you a medicine and, and there you go. That's this whole other exactly. side, to, uh, be, you know, behind the curtains. Exactly. And, and then you mentioned before joining GPCR Therapeutics, starting your own, your own mm -hmm. company. So I guess there is an entrepreneurial side of you as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it was to try and get back to, um, you know, doing membrane protein work. <laughs> like, like I said, <laughs> I think it's just something that I, I never really, you know, it never really left me. And so I, I mm -hmm. wanted to take a, a chance and, and, you know, do some, some work, some of that work on my own as well. That's fantastic, and I think I think it's not something uh, that common that people say, "Hey, I'm gonna start something on my own and see how that works." What gave you the initial idea, other than your love for for membrane proteins? Um, I think just being at, at small companies, I, I kind of mm -hmm. you you learn how are things done. Let's say on you know lim limited funding or. Yeah. How can you certainly get things going um, and, and really um, just understanding and, and seeing how th you get uh, that exposure at, at these uh, small companies that, that I worked at. You see how things uh, work, how um, one person may have to wear many multiple hats and it, mm -hmm. it, and it can be done. And so, you know, it's more of that. Uh, feeling of, you know, I, I think this is something that's exciting to me. Um, and so um, I, I, you know, decided to, to take that sort of chance. I love that. And you make a great point. And I think that's something that I'm always trying to, you know, put an emphasis on either on the podcast or every time I, I give a talk about, you know, career options, just because you you know, completed a PhD and, and one or two postdocs, that doesn't mean that you need to be a professor or that doesn't mean that you have to, you can only do a limited number of things. Correct. It, it, it means that you can be entrepreneurial. You can, as you mentioned, wear multiple hats, think outside the box and contribute in so many ways. And it again goes back to, to that kind of planning and self-knowledge where you need to figure out what makes you happy and try to find a job, whether it, you're working at a company or for yourself, or you're building something your, uh, yourself, something that you really enjoy doing. That's exactly right. That's that's exactly it. The, the you know really doing something that that you enjoy, and you know that kind of brings me to you know GPCR Therapeutics. I I do find that joy 
the subject matter, the mission of the company, and you know the the people that I work with. And I think you you really having all those is something special. So that's fantastic. I, I met well, I met you. I met Tina. Obviously, I, I talked to some some of the people at GPCR Therapeutics and. I thought uh, I thought it was just a you know great way great meeting with everybody and I loved your talk at the uh, Dr. GPCR summit, which is by the way this is for the audience it's already on our YouTube channel. Um, there are a lot of people who who got interested in that talk and uh, you know it was just amazing. I think it's a completely novel approach to think about targeting you know drugging GPCRs. That's period. correct. That's right. It, it really sort of takes it to another level, right? I mean, Keterodimer field or dimer field has been, you know, researched and hotly contested, but I think, you know, the new new methods that, that are coming out, um, some of the, at least some of the, the data that we have really is, you know, supporting this creation of, of a new targetable pathway that if you start to think about, you know, what we know about GPCRs, um, Yes, there's the G protein signaling. There's also the bias, you know, beta arrestin signaling. Um, but now, if you can, you know, combine two receptors and create a new sort of pathway or a different pathway, you're just sort of exponentially increasing the uh, the the repertoire for um, how these uh, receptors are, you know, fine tuned for whatever situation they're they're in in the cellular context. Exactly. And, and for a long time, this was a, a big, you know, discussion in the field. Oh, no, you need one receptor. No, actually, you need two. And and the difficulties around, for example, antibodies to detect endogenous receptors and see, okay, Absolutely. are they close enough or not? And But I always thought that, you know, having dimers in any context, but specifically in a disease context, allows diverse, diversifying the signaling. That's and that exactly can it. be very nicely targeted um, in cancer, for example. Yeah, and, and you actually, you know, brushed upon the uh, really, um, I guess one one of the challenges, right, is you know detecting GPCRs in general, and you know, let alone uh, dimers or, or heteromers. And so, I think there's still room for a lot of room for improvement there. So with yeah. you know tools and, and reagents to help really solidify um, some of these observations that I think a, a, a lot of labs have, you know, put forth in, in the literature, um, but are sort of perhaps lacking, you know, this extra piece of, you know, quote unquote, proving that they, they are yeah. present. Yeah, we need the ability to see them. <laughs> Correct, exactly. <laughs> So on, on the topic of GPCRs, and, and you mentioned, you know, beta, the beta renergic receptor, and I asked this from, from all of my guests, which one is your favorite? Which one is your favorite GPCR? Oh, it has to be the beta two, right? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you knew that, I was going to answer that. <laughs> that was my thought, <laughs> my initial thought, but I mean, you could have said 6 yes. 4 as well. Oh, that, that would have been a good company um, answer. You're right. But but I do, I, I have to say it's the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. It's um, the, you know, the, the one I, I worked on the most. It, it was, you know, structure that uh, us and, and colleagues, you know, solved. And so it's, it's really, it's really, uh, you know, near and dear to, to my heart. But, you know, CXCR4 is growing on me. <laughs> it, it has to that's one of my favorites because I worked a lot right. on CXCR4 um, but yeah I think since I started the podcast and I've been talking to so many people and they keep telling me about their favorite receptor I'm like oh this is actually cool so maybe I should you know, look <laughs> into it so yeah. I, I officially don't think I have a favorite one I have maybe sub favorites or sub sub families that are more oh yeah more there's, there's uh, so comfortable. Many. Um, yeah, yeah. So many cool options, absolutely. Exactly. So beta adrenergic, you mentioned, yes, the, the structure, and then we know it, and it's a great model receptor to work on. Um, what is it that we don't know yet? Or what are the questions that we are still thinking about when it comes to the beta adrenergic receptor? Um, I think, you know, going back to the, you know, the dimerization, heteromerization, I think there's, you know, some good evidence there that it, that the beta 2 may dimerize um does it heteromerize um we we certainly think so at, at the company and you know we have some 
uh, data we presented at the Dr. GPCR Summit. But so I think that that's still one challenge, really, I guess, um, uh, having more of that uh, convincing evidence of, of, of that. Um, and I think also just really, and, and maybe not just for the beta adrenergic receptor, but for GPCRs in general, is just understanding and, and really having a, um, a reliable uh, data set of, of the expression, the true expression in um, tissues, maybe in disease state versus normal or healthy state. I think there's just so, like, like we mentioned, there's methods or reagents that, that are lacking. And so I think for all GPCRs, we might be missing, you know, some uh, uh, important uh, evidence there of, of, of true expression, whether it's surface expression or even, you know, by, by RNA, you know, there's new methods. Single cell RNA seq is, is one that, you know, can really help out in, in that, in that field. But I think, you know, as far as, uh, you know, surface expression and you're talking antibodies against GPCRs, and that's really a, that's, it's a problem. And I think a, a lot of researchers face that. It is, it is. And I think, it, well, it's difficult to raise antibodies against GPCRs. Exactly. In, in an ideal world, having antibodies that specifically um, detect or recognize GPCRs and being able to go into native tissues. And I love the point that you made about you know, healthy versus disease state and being able to potentially use these as biomarkers mm -hmm. of disease state, or you can, you can track the changes of the repertoire of, of receptors that is expressed uh, in healthy versus disease state. And I think that's, that's something that that's worth investigating. And it would be really awesome to have, you know, systematically go ahead and go family by family and say, we're gonna exactly. raise the antibodies and there you go. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, it's, it's also from a standpoint of, you know, practical drug discovery, yeah. if you want to target a receptor, it, it needs to be there on, on the surface. Otherwise, you know, your, your drug's not going to have an effect. So that's, that's the other added, um, you know, benefit of having this information. Exactly. Exactly. And there's also the, um, the conformational component of, of these antibodies or these drugs as well, because you'd want to potentially select the conformation that is going to be beneficial to resolve or to at least alleviate the disease state. I'm just thinking CIC4. Absolutely. No, no, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. That's that's another huge challenge. So, you know, we can talk in general, we need antibodies, but then when you break it down, what kind of antibodies? It's, <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a yeah. daunting, it's, it's a huge <laughs> challenge. It is, it is. What other challenges do you think are there other than, you know, having antibodies to detect, um, you know, expression in disease states? Any other tools you can think of? Um, I think, you know, obviously from, from my angle currently, at, you know, GPCR therapeutics is really um, understanding what heteromers look like from a structural, uh, you know, at a structural level. So we've obviously had sort of the uh, you know explosion of, of the structural revolution in GPCRs, but you know having that information for uh, heteromers would be very helpful as far as you know not only providing okay what's what's that interface we can target that interface, but just really understanding what what it is that's going on from a you know protein protein interaction and maybe allosteric mechanism etc. So I think um, if anyone out there listening, you know, if, if they can, you know, have any ideas of how to crystallize heteromers, native heteromers, um, you know, I'm all ears. <laughs> that, 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 could, that could be really beautiful. I think that could, uh, scientifically speaking, would be a fantastic thing. Let's, let's say it bluntly, it would be a fantastic paper, but mm -hmm. it would also open up, I think, the, um, the road to really go in and surgically modulate heterodimer function. Exactly. That's exactly and that right. And that would be just fantastic. Yep. I, I, I completely agree. And so I think, you know, maybe, um, I guess maybe an, another challenge that's a little more just a general GPCR uh, challenge could be, um, again, once we start thinking about promiscuity of some of these GPCRs to their G protein. And then if you actually, I mean, I'm not going to say it's a misnomer, but, you know, 
GPCRs don't just couple to G proteins, they have other effects. And really understanding um, how how that is regulated on a you know maybe cell type specific manner could really just open up the 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 doors to you know really getting that fine tuned pharmacology that you know, you might be looking for or missing from you know your basic understanding of you know d- doing GS coupled assay cycle game P or whatever. Um, so really understanding that um, is, is I think a huge challenge, but you know, something that's worth looking into. Definitely, definitely. I think I love the idea of really, you know, understanding the structure of a given receptor of a receptor dimer, but at the same time, looking at what happens within the cell and how does that signal, how is that signal transduced? And what are the proteins, whether they're G proteins or any other uh, effectors, how do those interact? And the way I, I, I imagined is really this very, intricate map where you could zoom in to one specific receptor signaling pathway, G protein, you name it, and really look at it in healthy tissue versus Correct. disease state. And very, and it can be, and yeah, really having those tools to be able to quickly, relatively quickly and easily characterize what happens, what, what went wrong, basically. Exactly. And, you know, we're, Sort of, I, I guess, kind of in, in the era of you know wanting precision medicine. So understanding this is probably you know different between tissue types or cell types, and so really understanding that is um, you know could really go along with the pre- precision medicine approach, and um, it's currently lacking. It is. It is definitely. I, I, I know the answer to this one, but do you still think that GPCRs are good drug targets? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think, well, you know, I think, I think it was at the um, Dr. GPCR summit, uh, Brian Roth gave, gave a talk uh, mm-hmm. and he, he put it nicely. I mean, I think we, a lot of us, you know, our intro slide is a third of FDA approved drugs target GPCRs he yeah. sort of put it in a different way where I think he said only 10% of GPCRs have been targeted, letting you know that there's so much more available there and it's just yeah. a, a great way of thinking about it so yes many targets are available i think i think so too i think there i love i love the brian's talk as well and it's a great way as you mentioned to put it because so when and i do that too when i present and i talk about gpcr as i say you know 40 to 50 percent of uh, drugs target or by, target to act via gpcrs sure but but switching it around saying that you know only 10% of the GPCR, GPCRs are you know used have been up drugged. basically yeah, have exactly. been drugged you'd want to drug 50% of GPCRs and potentially that would take us at 100% of drugs absolutely going absolutely. through GPCRs um there is a lot of low hanging fruit that was already drugged that being said i i love i don't know who i whose presentation was this I think it, I think it was in, in one of your uh, in 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 your presentation of the summit, and I had this discussion with Pina as well when about repurposing drugs. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And now that we have the tools to better understand what these drugs do, repurposing them has a great deal of advantages. Absolutely, absolutely, and you you can you know sort of couple that with you know let's say biased agonism, right? Instead of thinking, oh, these were, you know, just sort of, sure, they bind, but they don't do anything. They, for all you know, they've, they've been, you know, signaling through another component. So absolutely. Yeah. Love it. I love it. All right. So we've talked a little bit about you wanting to, to be a, a doctor. You ended up being a scientist. Uh, you know, luck has had it. You you ended up in, in Brian Kubilka's lab. Um, what would be your advice to to young scientists who want to you know have a fulfilling career and contribute to the field? Oh, nice. Yeah, I think you know, there's there's various ways of of answering that, and I think um, I'd like to answer this question sort of taking on my experience, looking back to when I was a, a, journey, a junior scientist. Um, and I, I did lack, you know, confidence, you know, through, through 
undergrad, graduate school. I and mean, I think that really I've come now to realize that that probably was attributed to, you know, a diversity problem that we have in science and STEM. So I think that, um, you know, when you, you look at rough numbers, so again, I'm, I'm you know, Latin American, Latinx. Um, if you look at that community, you know, 20% of the U.S. population um, uh, is, is uh, Latinx, but they only account for like six to seven percent of, of PhDs in the U.S. And so really, I think coming from an underrepresented group, it's really hard to feel like like you belong, so to speak. And so I think that unfortunately, that trend does continue even in, you know, the, obviously in academia and in the workplace. Um, so I do think that. Um, one advice I, I would have would be to uh, uh, junior scientists of the underrepresented uh, group would be, you know, really the, the beauty about science is that your data can speak for itself. Your output, your production can be judged. And, and, and that's what should be judged, not necessarily you as a person, whether you belong or not. Um, and I think um, my advice is, you know, really understand that you may be taking this bold step by pursuing a field where you know we are not well represented, um, re regardless of what others may may say or may think, I, I think you you really are a, a pioneer at least for for this uh, community and and really having that confidence, feeling that you do belong. I think science you know science is for everyone, and so I think it's it's you know something that that we need to change slowly, but I think. You know, it's really important for uh, scientists uh, in, in these types of, uh, you know, mi minority groups with mi minority representation. It's it can be hard to, to, you know, to feel like like you belong at times. And so I think really, you know, if, if it's going back to something we said earlier, if it's something that you love, I think, um, you know, again, science is for everyone. And so really having the, the, you know, the, 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 the fortitude to stick with things and, you know, you can hopefully make a difference and, you know, things take time to change sometimes. So um, really uh, I, I think that that would be um, sort of my advice. I think um, there are great, you know, uh, groups out there trying to help with, with this. I know there's initiatives, you know, that, that have been started with, you know, NIH, et cetera. So that's that's really great great to see. Um, so um, I think yeah, I, I think that that's sort of what um, I, I would say to to that particular group. And I think in, in in general, just a scientific advice: always include controls. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I love that. You said it so well. You said it so well. And I think I think you're right. Um, being in an underrepresented minority is difficult. That being said, I think anyone junior, so let me just take a step back. Confidence, mm -hmm. you're not born with confidence. You build confidence over time. And the, the way I see it, there's two ways, N not only to build confidence, but to really put yourself in situations where you have to, it's like jumping in the deep deep water and just That's trying right. to yeah. get, your, get yourself out of it. There's one thing, one being able to, Put yourself in those situations where you're, you know, you you will learn something, even if it ends up being what you'd qualify as a failure. No, it's an experience. Mm -hmm. Number two, as you said, it, you said it, you put it very well. There are support groups. Um, you're not alone. Yes, and exactly. Looking looking for peers or for mentors, for people who have gone through these experiences, can be incredibly. Uh, supportive and it also can help you kind of exponentially accelerate your growth and at the same time build that confidence absolutely yes very very well said I think that's one component I, I miss really finding you know a, uh, a a mentor at some point in your career that you know yeah. it's sort of supports that and or you know may, maybe it's from an underrepresented group like you know like yourself it, it does have an impact. Um, I, I think yeah. I didn't realize that, you know, as, as I was going through things, but reflecting back, um, I, I've come to, you know, really appreciate that now. Yeah. The last great point that you made is, you know, science is fun and, and um, scientifically speaking, it doesn't matter 
what your gender is, who you are, where you come from. The data is the data. So include the controls. Exactly. Do your, your due diligence. And no one can dispute the data. It doesn't matter if the data is correct. There is no way of, of you know, editorializing or going around. The data is the data. And I think that's the beauty of science. Absolutely. That's right. So lo love, love the data. And there is no other, you know, there's no way around it. It is what it is. Yeah. As long as <laughs> you've included the right controls, definitely. That's, that's right. <laughs> So we've we've talked a little bit well we've talked at length by, by now about your your scientific trajectory that led you to where you are today but were there uh, looking back were there any aha moments that you had as a scientist or or uh, you know during your your career that kind of shaped uh, who you are today Yeah I I think you know from from a scientific point of view I think there's there's some, at least, you know, for me personally, aha moments, not, you know, revolutionary ch changing the field, so to speak. But I think really I, I was thinking back about, um, you know, some some moments that really stick in my my mind that kind of changed to or, or contributed to where I'm at. And I talked to you in the beginning about, you know, working at um, Xenoport, the transporter company. And I, I, I do really remember there, you know, learning from just a, a really great uh, senior RA at the time. Um, uh, her name was Tracy. She's just, uh, you know, one of the hardest working individuals and most patient teachers that I've ever had. And she was just um, dead set on teaching me how to run uh, electrophysiology in Sinopus O site. So like not the most straightforward thing to teach someone right out of undergrad, but the moment that I, I I understood what I was doing and, you know, the experiment started working. It was just really kind of a, um, just sort of a light bulb went off as to how uh, a protein can be not only taking a, a substrate through into the cell, but also it's coupled to um, an ion, for example, the, the uh, sodium glucose transporter and all these things that have to happen in concert for, you know, to, for example, to get the readout for electrophysiology. So for me, it was an aha moment from like, it really just kind of like opened up my eyes that it's, there's so much going into just a simple thing that, you know, we might take for granted uh, on a protein level. And so I think that, that really early on was one of the moments that um, uh, sort of pushed me to want to learn more, to really investigate membrane proteins in general. And I think, you know, to, Two other aha moments, as you probably guessed it, were working in the Kabilka lab. It was just, um, you know, how, how could they not be? <laughs> um, so I think uh, really uh, one aha moment for me personally was after the, the first um, crystal structure was solved um, in an inactive state uh, bound to an inverse agonist. And we started doing a uh, collaboration with the Schweikert lab at UCSF, the study led by uh, Peter Kolb, a um, uh, great computational uh, biologist. And the idea was to use the inactive state structure to perform in silico high throughput screening. And to me, that was like, I had no clue. Like it was initially like, wow, that, this is great. We got the structure. But really, what what are you supposed to do with that? And it's like, oh, this is this is what you do with the structure. And so, I know it's you know, a, a junior scientist, pretty naive, but really seeing how how this all came about, all the effort that went into um, doing this in silico project. And I was fortunate enough to um, work with um, uh, Dan Rosenbaum, who's currently at UT Southwestern. He was a postdoc in Brian's lab, just a brilliant, brilliant scientist. Um, you know, I was working under him and just really helping ID, identify and, and screen the in silico hits. And, you know, lo and behold, we found, uh, you know, a potent inverse agonist that had a completely unexpected chemotype. And so that sort of study really just um, really, you know, put the, the emphasis on, okay, you get a crystal structure. Now you can see it. But you can actually do so much with a, with with a structure. Obviously, now you know we understand that 
you also need to do molecular dynamics, et cetera. But, you know, this, this study that I was part of was just really, um, you know, it's something that really uh, stood out in, in my head and something that, you know, I think is going to be important for quite some time, sort of the uh, uh, structure-based drug discovery and in, in, in silico methods. Um, and probably the, my, my third aha moment is pretty simple. I mean, the story leading up to it is, is great, I think, but it's, you know, when we saw the high resolution diffraction of the um, uh, nanobody stabilized active beta two. So the first active state for a druggable GPCR, that, that was very thrilling to see. But really, the you know the amount of work that went into it was extraordinary, and um, I think it's just really a, a, a very rewarding project. Um, so I, I was lead co-author on that with uh, Soren Rasmussen. He's over at uh, University of Copenhagen, and He Jung Choi um, over at Seoul National University. Um, and I think along the way, the that project had various aha moments, um, and I think the first one that um, I clearly remember was at the end of a lab meeting. Brian, you know, goes, goes up to the, to the whiteboard or uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it was a chalkboard at, at MCP. I, that, <laughs> the building's a little bit on the, the older end um, at Stanford. Um, and, you know, he introduces the idea of using nanobodies or, or lamp llama or camelid derived antibodies. Yeah. And I think the whole lab at the time, you know, that we, we didn't study that. They weren't really that popular as far as, you know, for as a tool or as a reagent. And so I think we really were, you know, thinking, you know, Brian has got one of these very creative ideas, but, you know, come on, uh, camels, llamas, this is getting out of hand, trying to immunize a, that, that um, you know, a, another species like that. But, you know, watching him explain, and I actually clearly remember seeing the excitement in his face, almost as if he knew that this, this could be it. Um, so that was just, just really great. It was, you know, he knew it was unconventional, but a, an unconventional approach at the time, but it could hold the key. And, you know, obviously, you know, he, he was a hundred percent correct there. And the minute we started, you know, producing these nanobodies, um, you know, in collaboration with Jan Steyert's lab in, in Brussels, I, we just, we knew we were onto something there. And so, um, you know, just the, the rest is history as, as they say. That's fantastic. And, and see it, uh, the, the aha moments that you just described to go back to the fact that, you know, you've developed confidence through going through experiences, which not only built your confidence as a scientist, but confidence overall. And, um, I relived these moments with you now that you were telling them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. You're you're absolutely right. I think when you know when when you see things work well and you, you do put the you know time and effort and you know things things are rewarding. That's not to say that if things don't work out that you shouldn't really you know have any confidence because we all know a lot of things don't work out and. Not not to talk too much about Brian Kobilka, but we we know his story about you know the Howard Hughes funding and how we got to the point where experiments had to be stopped. We were just you know kind of writing or preparing manuscripts, and it's just crazy I think to to think that now probably for junior scientists scientists listening to that might seem weird, you know that something like this could happen. Um, and so. The perseverance and, and really learning at every step is is something you know that that I picked up there as well. Um, you make a great point about things not working. Uh, most of the time, things don't work, and and I think those are also lessons learned. The goal, or I think the the orientation that we have as scientists is the ability to bounce back and to go back to the drawing board and uh, kind of use the fuel from that time that it, when it worked or that paper that we published and we made a significant discovery to kind of, you know, hold off, be able to manage all those disappointments when, you know, your, yes. your gel is, there's no bend or, you know, your Western blood didn't work or your Eliza or you don't have any binders and then- Just another you know, day. 
<laughs> exactly. Just another day at the lab or when you come in and all your cells are contaminated or right. You know, just, it's okay. It's, it I, happens. There's always, and, uh, there's always a lesson in, in everything. I, I think in, in every experiment and yeah. I, I remember something that, um, Bob Lefkowitz said at, at the Dr. GPCR summit as well, where he, he said that he, he could trace back every experiment, um, all the way back to his first experiment. And that's because you learn something from, from everything. It leads to a question that, you know, you, you answer whether it failed or not, you're answering something. So that that's one example. <laughs> Exactly. And, and you mentioned, funny that you mentioned uh, Bob Lefkowitz. He also, uh, I think it was in the podcast episode where he was mentioning that at the end of the year, each year he goes back and he sits down and he looks at his to-do list uh, for the previous year. And if he's completed 20% of that, he's happy. And, uh, you know, we don't talk a lot about failures. We don't talk enough about, you know, experiments that didn't work, but also about the fact that, you know, just whatever you're doing do your best put in yes hard work put in smart work and and things will work out uh, no matter what maybe not in that lab maybe not in that experiment maybe not in that field but whatever happens if you just learn to adapt to the situation you're going to see the silver lining uh, at the other end of it uh, absolutely Adap adaptability i think is it's a it's key true. trait for scientists. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we all have that bug, you know, when when you go home and nothing worked in the past week and you're like, OK, next week, I'm just going to you know, give it give it my best and try and figure out what didn't work and, and uh, you know, find the right control, as you mentioned. Uh, exactly. And, and hopefully, you know, have, have your mm -hmm. uh, your next aha moment. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. So last last question. And I think uh, in my chat with Pina, we talked about this as well. Um, so you're hiring at GPCR Therapeutics. I know that there are many positions. Your site is growing. Where can people uh, find these job descriptions? Uh, so I think we we will probably send some job descriptions over to the Dr. GPCR uh, uh, career page as well. Um, we will have it at our uh, on our website, uh, gpcr.co.kr. Um, we'll have a, a, a listing there shortly. Um, so we're, you know, looking for, always looking for a uh, great talent. And so, you know, please, please reach out um, if, if interested, you know, we're, uh, with sites, like I mentioned in Korea, our US site is growing uh, currently uh, quite rapidly actually. So it's a, it's a great sign and it's, it's a great time to join the company. That's fantastic. And yes, we'll be happy to uh, to put up these job ads on our on our website. And we've also started uh, circulating these on social media so people have Wonderful. better visibility to this. But I will also invite everyone listening to the podcast to come to your episode page where there will be links to GPCR Therapeutics to your um, LinkedIn uh, page as well. So people can come in and find you and chat with you directly. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that'll be great. Thank you, Yamina. Of course. And with this, Juan Jose, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciated uh, our chat. Super exciting what you're doing. And uh, let's catch up soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I enjoyed the time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We'd like to thank our guest, as well as our team members, Attila Forrest, Ines Pinero, and Alexa Truan. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter today and find us on YouTube as well. If you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe. Mm -hmm.